Good morning, church. This morning, I want to welcome you to, the, to this morning's Sabbath school. And today, we want to discuss a very important topic. I am pretty sure all of us have been affected one way or the other with uh, COVID-19. But of uh, particular interest, this morning we want to discuss COVID-19 and diet management. Today, more than before, have we had families and caregivers faced with complex situations due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Just to give you an, an overview, today Zimbabwe has recorded uh, 4,221 cases and of these 81 de deaths have been recorded. So COVID-19 presents itself with symptoms that require different types of nutrition management. The symptoms of COVID-19 with nutritional implications include a running nose, fever, cough, headache, sore throat, severe uh, pneumonia, acute respiratory distress, and septic shock. We have obviously uh, vulnerable groups, groups like children under five, uh, pregnant women, lactating mothers, elderly, people living with HIV and AIDS, and people with uh, uh, underlying medical conditions, such as uh, diabetes mellitus, cancer, chronic respiratory uh, diseases. These people form part of our families. And in diet management, we ought to take care what we eat. Diet is the sum of food consumed by a person or other organisms. So the word diet often implies the use of specific intake uh, of nutrition for health and uh, other reasons. So nutrition management is very important to enhance immune responses for infected persons against uh, viral infections. So studies have shown that Im immune responses can be weakened by inadequate nutrition. So when food is properly selected and prepared so that the basic nutrients are consumed in the correct ratios and amounts, we can be assured of good nutrition. All foods contain, uh, all natural foods contain seven essential nutrients. However, there are different uh, amino acids, fatty acids, uh, vitamins, mineral elements that are found in varying amounts in different foods. So we need to eat a variety of foods to get these nutrients in sufficient quantities. Therefore, in diet management, it is essential that the one who is responsible in the household for planning of meals uh, takes care to include foods from the different food groups. Diet management is essential because from the food that we eat, uh, nutrients are replenished for physical growth and development, for mental growth and cognitive development, for improving our well-being, for us to have enhanced in ability to fight illnesses and also to boost our immunity, to reduce chronic diseases, and also, most important, to recover from illnesses. Let us look at nutrition management for mild symptoms. Earlier on, we spoke about the various uh, symptoms that may be uh, uh, associated with uh, COVID-19, uh, such as runny nose, fever, cough, headache, 
and a sore throat. What then must a good caregiver do in a home to boost or to prevent or to manage uh, the diet? We ought to ensure that there is adequate intake of fluids. At least two liters per day or more is required. In the event that uh, the family has th these symptoms, uh, we ought also to increase the amounts of nutrients, nutritious food that is uh, being eaten. This should uh, include a variety of energy-rich uh, foods, milk, legumes, fruits and vegetables. And also consider supplementation with vitamin C, zinc, vitamin A, vitamin B6, vitamin D, iron, folate, if these are not being uh, gotten uh, in adequately in the diet. So, we also need to ensure that there is adequate rest. The family needs to rest in the event that there are these symptoms. Uh, we also need to reduce stress and exercise. Cough can also be relieved by use of honey, use of pineapples, use of garlic, use of uh, ginger. This can be combined into, a, into, into the drinking water and uh, make it uh, palatable. So, People that are suffering from COVID-19 or symptoms of COVID-19 also have a poor appetite or early satiety. Early satiety is when people eat a, a, a few tablespoons of food and they are already full. So in COVID-19 cases or in people that have symptoms of COVID-19, we find a poor appetite. We ought to then boost uh, the nutrients that are being given to the family through nutrient-dense foods. We eat small, frequent meals. In nutrition management, we talk about six SFF, meaning to say six small, frequent feedings. This will in, 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 in enhance uh, in, in nutrient absorption and by, the, by the family. It also makes sure that the family um, members are able to, to take the, the recommended daily allowances. So eat small, frequent, nutrient-dense food. By nutrient-dense food, what do we mean? Say, for instance, you have cooked porridge in the morning. You can add a tablespoon of uh, peanut butter to your porridge, and this will enhance uh, the, the, the nutrients in the, in the millimeal porridge. You can also break an egg or an egg yolk into your porridge. This also will, is an example of a, a nutrient-dense meal. Hence, if somebody eats one or two or three tablespoons, they have adequate nutrients required for the day. Shortness of breath is also one of the symptoms uh, that are isolated in uh, COVID-19 patients or those that have got symptoms of COVID-19. So in managing uh, shortness of breath, we need to eat a diet with fewer carbohydrates. We need to use healthy fats such as avocado pears, uh, sunflower oil to meet the nutrient uh, energy requirements for the period when breath is uh, difficult. So what are we talking about when we are saying avocado pears? God has made it in such a way that different foods at different times of the season give certain nutrients to, to, the, to our families. Avocado pears, for instance, 
and in season we've got oranges and lemons also in season so we can make use of these in our uh, in our day-to-day -day, uh, meals and hence boosting the nutrients and boosting our immunity we need to eat proteins from good sources like eggs lean meat uh, in addition to a healthy diet so we also need to avoid overfeeding patients with uh, COVID-19 also experience weight, weight, weight loss or people that have got uh, symptoms might also uh, lose weight because they are not eating well because also because of the cough their appetite is very suppressed so how do we then manage weight loss we need to ensure intake of food uh, from all food groups has been incorporated in the diet adequate proteins will also uh, keep the patient from muscle wasting so as a guideline 1.2 to 1.7 grams per kg per day of uh, protein is required what are we saying we are saying you need to calculate the amount of proteins that are given to each and every individual uh, in the family and ensuring that we have met those uh, uh, in, in, in the diet. So if you are, if, let's say for instance, uh, if, uh, you are a mother who weighs 70 grams, you can calculate the amount of protein by saying 70 grams times 1.2 grams times the amount of uh, your, your kgs, that means 70 kgs, and then that will give you the total amount of protein required for the day. And then you divide that by the number of meals that are to be taken. So in, in, you need to then also ensure that you have provided for energy uh, in the diet. So energy, we provide 30 to 35 grams per kg of body weight per day. So, for example, if you are 70 kgs, you multiply 70 by 30 uh, grams, it gives you the amount of kilograms that you need to take, and then ultimately the total kilocalories that you need to take. I am pretty sure people are talking about how then do we provide our families? The impact of COVID-19 on households has had uh, households with inadequate food consumption. Some households have lost income. Some households' uh, food intake uh, has also been reduced. There has been minimum dietary diversity. Some households have lost jobs. So, Yes, the income has reduced, but we are still eating. I'm pretty sure we have had uh, panic buying and price hikes due to this uh, uh, lockdown. Micronutrient deficiencies have also been experienced. Staple foods uh, 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 and cereal wasting has also been experienced because of COVID-19. People have turned to food only to escape uh, monotony, boredom, and this has resulted in increased uh, calorie intake. I'm happy that the breakfast culture has emerged in most homes as a result of parents working from home, children being locked down, people now have increased their intake of, of, um, of breakfast. There has also been an increase in the 
eating of miracle foods, for instance, uh, foods that are believed to get rid of uh, coughs and flus and symptoms, such as lemons, garlic, ginger, and uh, well, some of these foods are uh, essential. Definitely they do work, but let's also be very uh, cognizant of food fadism or nutritional quackery. Yes, garlic, ginger, lemon are good foods that we need to incorporate in our diet. Everything needs to be balanced. There should not be uh, too much of certain nutrients. So how then do we balance our meals? We ought to ensure that all the food groups of all the essential nutrients are there. Take note of these essential nutrients, zinc. Zinc is essential for immune response systems. It has a role in, in the structure and the functioning of uh, membranes of which the mucosal membranes also uh, are essential uh, to maintain uh, for, for our families. We also uh, need to take note that zinc is essential for test. So where test has been compromised in uh, COVID-19 patients and where appetite has been compromised, zinc is one nutrient that we need to make sure it has been fortified in the food that we are providing the patient or our families. We also need to take note that good sources of zinc are our whole grains, maize, rice, wheat, also red meat, and with special emphasis, lean meat is better than uh, uh, meat that is laden with fat. So also take note of sesame seeds, sunflower seeds, and vegetables. On vegetables, we need to watch out for oxalic and phytic acid found in, in the stalks. There is a tendency of people making use of vegetable stalks these will render the zinc bio unavailable. Parents, mothers who are pregnant, have a tendency of eating soil. It is advisable not to, uh, not to, to succumb to this pica, as Soil will, has a tendency of binding the zinc unavailable. It is unavailable. That zinc is unavailable to the body. So also boost vitamin C. It helps to prevent colds, common colds. It is also a very good and powerful antioxidant that protects uh, against damage uh, of our uh, blood cells. It is also essential is it uh, aids in absorption of iron. So we are talking of iron as an important component in boosting our immunity. What we are all just talking about now is that we ought to boost the immunity. If the immunity is boosted, all these uh, uh, preconditions that we are talking about, uh, we will have prevented them. We will have prevented the cough, we will have prevented pulmonary infections, we will have prevented all these uh, symptoms that one who has uh, been diagnosed with COVID-19 can succumb to. So we ought to ensure good nutrition. We ought to ensure that all the vulnerable groups that I've mentioned earlier on have been protected uh, through good nutrition. We also need to stop, if ever we have been eating junk food, stop eating junk food. Stop having processed 
foods like pizza, burgers, bis uh, biscuits. Avoid sugar in the diet. Use, uh, uh, use more natural sugars like honey, uh, sugars from dates and uh, uh, raisins. Non-seasonal fruits and vegetables such as uh, watermelons and grapes are also very uh, essential but we ought to use those that are in season. Most important of all, let's grow our own vegetables. Let's grow our own uh, fruits in our backyards. A nutritional gardening does not require a huge space. You can make use of buckets, uh, you can make use of old uh, tires, right uh, where you are, you can use, you can use the, uh, the different uh, foodstuffs. You can grow your different foodstuffs, I mean. Most important of all, brethren, let us take care of our families by boosting the immunity. Take cognizance of what we eat. We are what we eat. COVID-19 is real, but we can prevent it by boosting the immunity of our families. COVID-19 can also be prevented by ensuring that the diet has been fortified by exercising, by living a healthy lifestyle. It is a choice. We are what we eat. And I trust and hope that you continue to be blessed uh, throughout this day as we worship in our homes due to this COVID-19 uh, pandemic we could not meet but may God truly bless you. I leave you with this verse, uh, 3 John 2. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health, just as your soul prospers. May God truly bless us now and forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. So I've heard the church talk about this plan called I Will Go. It's got my attention, but what is it? I Will Go is the brand new strategic plan for the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The phrase is rooted in key passages like Isaiah 6, when Isaiah responded to God's call by saying, Here am I, send me. And Matthew 28, when Jesus said, Therefore go and make disciples. Now it's our turn. The strategic plan is part of our response. It will do two things. One, equip you with what you need to embrace your call to mission. And two, provide you with indicators to track your progress as you respond, okay, Jesus, I will go. I think I'm following, but what is that mission? I'm glad you asked. Our mission as Avenus is to make disciples of Jesus Christ who live as his loving witnesses and proclaim to all people the everlasting gospel of the three angels' messages in preparation for his soon return. It is a big task, but no one has to do it alone. We have a massive support system of more than 21 million members in over 160,000 congregations throughout the world. Phew, that's a lot of members. Have we made progress? With that many, how could we not? But we're always open to improvement. I Will Go builds on the success of our previous strategic plan called Reach the World, where we set out to... Let me guess, Reach the World? <laughs> what gave it away? Following Reach the World, the Church evaluated the effectiveness of our different initiatives worldwide to gain valuable insights for the future. Basically, after years of work and research, we developed that evaluation system and transformed it into a strategy that will run from 2020 to 2025, which we're calling, I Will Go. Okay, evaluation, got it. What happens with those insights? Adventist church leaders create a plan and then what? Just tell the world what to do? <laughs> Not at all. All that research will only be worthwhile if Adventists all around the world engage, collaborate, and innovate right where they are. I Will Go isn't about telling you what to do. It's about helping you follow through with what God has already placed on your heart. Every spiritual influencer needs support to be successful, 
and the church wants to provide that. Ooh, I like the idea of getting support. So how does it work? I Will Go is made up of 10 objectives that are divided into three areas of impact, mission, spiritual growth, and leadership. Each objective has its own key performance indicators, or KPIs for short. KPIs are measurable ways to help you determine whether or not you are achieving your current objective. There's no sign-up needed. They're there for you as you need them. Think of them like segments in a progress bar. Progress tracking sounds great, but what if I don't even know where to start? Don't worry. The KPIs also serve as a sort of brainstorming tool with examples to help you get started. Some KPIs are intended for those in church leadership roles. Others are intended for individuals like you and me. And the objectives can help you determine which KPIs to use. The great thing is, if the Holy Spirit inspires you to create something completely new that isn't on the list, yet accomplishes the mission, go for it. What about church initiatives we've already been doing? Does this mean that we'll replace them? Nope. Initiatives like digital evangelism or revival and reformation are actually methods of fulfilling the I Will Go plan. Take, for example, hmm, the TMI initiative. Too much information? <laughs> no. Total member involvement. Oh, I've heard of that. It's where all members of the Adventist Church are involved in some form of intentional mission. Yes, sir. TMI is just one way to fulfill the I Will Go plan because it seeks to involve everyone. I'd share more, but I don't want to give you too much information. <laughs> I see what you did there. So basically, the I Will Go strategy helps Adventists like me create brand new initiatives and improve the initiatives that we already do. You got it. I Will Go is not some feel-good slogan for lukewarm members to comfortably observe mission from afar. If we're serious about completing the mission, we need to strategize. That's why we're urging all who bear the Adventist name to understand and embrace the I Will Go strategic plan, from the areas of impact down to the KPIs. We may talk the talk, but the I Will Go plan translates our mission into tangible, realistic goals in order to walk the walk. By applying them, we can ensure we practice what we preach. I think I get it now. This is a rallying cry for Adventists everywhere to fully embrace the calling God has placed on them. Jesus commanded, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations. And this is our opportunity to say, I will go. Whenever the Holy Spirit inspires you with ideas for how you and your local church can make an impact, we challenge you to respond, I, I will go. go. Ten-year-old Joe watched movies and played video games with friends at his home in the Solomon Islands, but he wasn't happy. Joe's family lived in a poor neighborhood in the South Pacific country's capital, Honiara. Neighbors sold illegal drugs, and children stole and got into trouble with the police. Joe's house was a popular place for neighborhood boys to hang out every evening. He noticed that one of his friends didn't talk like the other boys and participated in something called a Pathfinder Club every Sabbath. Joe decided to join his friend at the Seventh-day Adventist Church to learn more. Soon, he joined the Pathfinders as well and went to church every Sabbath. After a while, Joe and the other Pathfinders were invited to fly to Australia to attend a campery for Pathfinders from all over the South Pacific Division. He really wanted to go, so Mom worked hard to save money for his plane ticket. When Mom was finally able to buy his ticket, Joe flew to the campery and enjoyed every second of it. When Joe returned home and the neighborhood boys came over that evening, he told stories from the campery. The boys loved the stories, so they asked to hear more the next evening. Then Joe thought to himself, My friends like to hear about Pathfinders. Why not tell them about Jesus, too? So each evening when his friends came over, Joe kept telling them stories from the Pathfinder Campery, but also began to share stories from the Bible. Joe's friends enjoyed his stories so much that they invited other boys from the neighborhood to come hear them too. Soon, 30 to 40 boys came to Joe's house every evening to learn more about Jesus. Although mom didn't have much money, she began to cook food for the children to eat after story time. She somehow always had enough food for everyone. Joe's new friends began to ask him if they could join Pathfinders, and four joined him at church the next Sabbath. More of his friends came to church the following week. The Pathfinder leader couldn't understand where all these children were coming from. Joe, why are so many kids from your neighborhood coming to Pathfinder Club? He asked. What did you do? 
I didn't do anything, Joe replied. I just tell them stories about what we did in Australia, and we have evening devotions, that's all. The leader asked to visit Joe's home to see the evening get-togethers for himself. When he came that evening, he was amazed at what he saw. Afterward, he said to Mom, this neighborhood would be a good place to open a church. He noticed that Joe's house had a large unfinished living room that no one used and asked if it could be used for Sabbath worship. Mom agreed. Several dozen neighborhood children came to Joe's house for church the next Sabbath. All the Pathfinder leaders and their families came as well, and they brought food for everyone. Then something happened that made Joe very happy. Mom decided to be baptized. Not long after, his 20-year-old cousin was baptized too, and so were three of his neighborhood friends whom Joe had introduced to Pathfinders. Today, Joe's living room is packed every Sabbath with about 70 people, and plans are underway to open a permanent church in the neighborhood. Now, Joe is 13 years old. He's humble in appearance and speech, but no one doubts that God is using him in a powerful way. I may be small, but in God's hand, I can grow a church. Like Joe, you too can help grow God's church as you share Jesus with your friends and family. Greetings, everybody. This is exam day, and we are so excited to have the theme, Loving All. Based on John 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. And in our theme, Loving All, is what I'm going to emphasize this morning. Indeed, it is a difficult task to love all. No wonder why God had to emphasize this. Today, as a Zam day, I could have brought some friends, but because of this uh, lockdown, COVID lockdown, they would not be amongst us. They were going to share some heart-touching stories of how they have gone through the experiences of their lives, both in their families and in the church. Loving all will require that we have love, mercy, and compassion. Just like COVID-19, it is impossible to measure the effects of HIV and AIDS pandemic. Think of the economic costs, the emotional turmoil, needless deaths, loss of productivity, orphaned children, unaccountable tears, and the paralyzing grief I'm sure only eternity will reveal the magnitude of the effects of these pandemics. Loving all, why should we be discussing this this particular morning? In the church today, there is the attitude of stigma and discrimination. It's not loud. It's whispered in the corridors. It's whispered in the churches. It's whispered in our homes. It's whispered all over. And hence, you will notice that it is a subject that is rarely talked about, stigma and discrimination. Yet stigma is, the, is more deadlier than the infection itself. Countless people have suffered stigma. Isolation, loneliness, and apprehension that come as a result of knowing that they are infected or affected 
Oh, there are some people who are going about sharing information that is confidential. Understanding stigma and discrimination is so essential for the church today. Why is it important? It's essential as it is just like a magnifying glass. It provides both the church and individual an approach to fight these objectionable tendencies. Stigma arises from unfavorable attitudes, mindsets, or negative labeling. These are thoughts or opinions that are clouded, that is stigma, biased, prejudiced, unfair, or information without sufficient evidence. And there are examples of stigma that we normally find even in our church today, where some people would think infected persons are cursed by God. I have heard so many people saying this, saying perverse statements, and also looking at individuals infected as disgraceful, and even considering them as sinners of highest degree and also being immoral. However, discrimination looks at the negative behaviors, actions, demeaning stares, how people look at people who are HIV uh, positive. Gossiping, rejection, Distancing, withdrawal, abuse, neglect, and at times it even includes withholding proper care that must be accorded to people who are going through these challenges. May I hasten to say stigma and discrimination are foreign to the mission of our church today. Because love, mercy, and compassion should be part of that mission. No wonder why Jesus had to say this parable when somebody asked, somebody who was a lawyer, somebody who was educated, he asked the question, who is my neighbor. And instead of giving an answer there and there, Jesus related a parable which I'm not going to read, but we find in, Ma in, in, in Luke chapter 10. And the question was on verse 25, who is my neighbor? And Jesus reflected on the story of the Good Samaritan as a way of putting across the lesson he wanted to. As we will find in the story of the Good Samaritan, this story teaches us to love all people. The Good Samaritan disregarded his own personal safety as he reached out to help this man who had been a victim of violence. He took time and realized the need of this man who had been robbed. And we find in this story unfortunate incidences that are being reflected. One had to deal with the Levite, a religious person. 
He did not take his time to help out in this situation. Similarly, the priest could not give the Jew care. And I'm wondering, the church as a religious organization, whether people living with HIV and AIDS are our neighbors. People living with HIV and AIDS are still people. They need church family's love. They need acceptance. They need care. They need love. And in this instance, Jesus zeroed in and talked about zero discrimination. And here he was referring in his story to someone who was receiving help and this person was half dead. To our context, this may imply that this person was unconscious. He was not even aware of who was helping him. And it's important for us as a church to realize that not all people who are HIV positive are going to die. Some will survive. In our own context, we have some people who have had a lot of social support to the extent that they have surprised so many people. They have lived so many years because they have received this support. Because the last sense to die in a person is the sense of hearing. This person was half dead. And I suppose that this person was listening and hearing to everything that was going in his immediate environment. Though he had great need, he expected this need, which could not be availed to him. And we realize that as we minister, even to people who are HIV positive, we need to realize that there are people who need our care. We should not condemn them to death. We should not stigmatize them to death. And hence, we find Jesus being our example as he relates this story. Are we aware that Jesus fought discrimination during his time? Think of the way he considered the tax collectors, the prostitutes of his day, the lepers, the neglected children, the woman at the well who was isolated by her community. All these people found solace in Jesus Christ. And the call for our church today is to be like the Good Samaritan, who would reflect love, compassion, and mercy as upheld by Jesus Christ. In order for us to do that, like Christ, our church has the mandate to give to our community, the mandate to expose all forms of stigma and discrimination, to exercise discrimination and stigma, to eliminate all forms of stigma and discrimination. Because John 3 verse 16 reflects to us that our God loves all people. He is no discriminator of persons. He loves everybody. He sent his son to die for all of us. No wonder why even in Matthew chapter 11 verse 28, he invites all to come to him, all who labor and are heavy laden, 
He says all. In other words, he is not considering creed. He is not considering color. He is not considering ethnic background. He is not consider, considering social status, even medical condition, being HIV having HIV status or having COVID-19. He says all. He allows all to come to him to receive his mercy, to receive his compassion. No wonder why he would, in his time, reach out even to the lepers. And 1 John 4 verse 8 is quite challenging to us who are living at this hour. 1 John 4 verse 8 reads, God is love and we are his children. If God is love, and as God's children, we need to follow the love that our Father has. He looked at the world, and he gave his only begotten Son. And as a church today, when we see people in various situations of life, difficult situations of life, we need to be like our Father, who is loving, our Father, who is caring. For God so loved the world, and we, his children, should love those who are going through difficult times. And yes, it's important that the Bible becomes our tool our tool of hope, a, a tool that all of us can use to dispel stigma and discrimination. Why the Bible? The Bible has already told us when we read the book of Genesis that the diseases and sicknesses that we have today is because of the fallen state. It's because of sin, and hence we don't need to be discriminating anybody. It gives us all the reasons as to why people are going through difficult times. And as a church, we need to be led by our God to do what is right. So in the Bible, even during the time of Christ, there were no outcasts. There should be no outcasts in the church that we have today. All who are affected and infected should find a home in the church today. They should have that sense of belonging, the sense of leaving their burdens at the feet of Christ as it is reflected in us as individuals, as it is reflected in us as a corporate church. And we need also to realize that God can avail healing. As we find that even in the Bible, there were medical provisions. I will take you to 2 Kings chapter 5, verses, uh, verses 1 and 2 and several other chapters where we find the leprous Naaman. No hope. Leprous had no cure. Yet, when the man realized that there was a healer in Israel, he went there. There was no discrimination to say, you are not a Jew, you are not a Hebrew. He was healed because that's our God. That's what we should follow as a church. We need to love all. As we celebrate so many years of upholding what the 
Adventist International AIDS Ministry has said, we need to think about these things, that we have a loving God who is caring, who loves everybody, who wants us to give that healing, which comes even through social support, the healing that comes through our relational advantage that we have as a church, where we are evangelizing to call many to him. As we reach out to people, we are reaching out to people who have already their baggages and they need our care. And by the way, it's not those who are coming who have only challenges, even from within us. I have always wondered as a pastor, why even support groups amongst our churches are not so effective? And I have concluded, it's stigma and discrimination. And I am saying today, Christ being our master, Christ being our leader, he has taught us that we need to love everybody. There should be no outcasts in his community. He needs to reach out to everybody so that they will have the joy that we find in his church. As we celebrate this day, of reaching out to those who are having challenges. I am calling upon you, I am calling upon you, and I am calling upon myself to be a responsible someone who is supposed to give the care that is due to our brothers and sisters, even those who are in the church, and even those who are in the world. We need to, care, to take care of them. We need to uphold them. Even if they may not be members of the church, our mandate is to allow them to see the love of Christ. May the Lord help you and me to offer that love, to offer that mercy, to offer that compassion, to offer what is due to people who belong to God. May our God bless us. Thank you. Amen.